Try it again. Hello. Check it. All right, welcome to SVBR number eight. Um, unfortunately, we do not have Cymatic Bruce as an MC, so I'm filling in for him tonight. It's the best I can. We make do. Um, hopefully, he'll be by later, but maybe not. We'll find out. <laughs> um, but we have a great night planned. Uh, we have uh, Matt Carroll, who is going to be talking about stomps, which some of you got to try last time, which is a low-cost locomotion system for VR. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good description. And we have Brian Bullard, who is going to be talking about um, GUI in Unity using the Daikon Forge library, which is a good alternative to NGUI, and uh, looks really interesting. And we have Howard Rose from First Hand, who is going to be uh, talking about his um, it's not an HMD, but it is a VR stereoscopic display used in the medical field. And we have a, we'll have a quick um, talk from Amir from Sixth Sense, uh, who's going to talk about the Make VR Kickstarter reboot and answer some questions there. So give us a chance to give a little feedback, I hope. And then we're going to break into our demos. A lot of fun demos here. Uh, see some new faces. A lot of familiar faces, so we're off to a good start. So without any further ado, uh, here is uh, Matt Carroll and talking about stomps with a Z. Yeah, with a Z. Thank you, Thank you Carl. Uh, can you get this up? Oh, I got you. This is my second time here at SBVR and uh, it was, my first time was one of the funnest nights of my life. I mean, uh, I've been in VR for years now, uh, and I've kind of always been an immersive personality, you know, moving my body with video games and getting sucked into TVs. But anyways, uh, I've been working on a project for VR now for a while, uh, Stomps Controller, and uh, I had been trying to show it off to friends, and in the five years I've been working on it, I maybe showed it off a total of five times. And uh, every single time I was disappointed. Uh, VR has this stigma around it where the engineers think that it's impossible and the common person, I guess, uh, thinks that it's some mad scientist game. And they don't understand it. So every time I showed it off, uh, I was disappointed. Nobody really understood what was going on. And uh, so I kind of gave up on it. And uh, I came down here, I brought the demo just as like a side note, thinking maybe I'd set it up in the back, and I did. I grabbed one of these little rolly chairs out of the, the main area and put it back there and just kind of left it back hoping to just show the rift off to some people who had never tried it before. And so I left it back there. I got pulled out of the room to do a, a little interview with a journalist. And uh, when I came back, there was a line of people standing by my device. And uh, I was so proud. I was honored. And I'm honored to speak today uh, just to be up here talking about a device that I've really been pushing for years now. Um, so, I have a quick little presentation for you. Uh, I'll try to make it quick because really the funnest part of this is the demonstrations. I mean, the, we'll get the presentations out of the way as fast as possible uh, so that we can get to that. Um, but this is a, a quick little history of just my invention uh, that I've been working on for a while, Stomps. Um, and it is the story of it because this has been going on for uh, about five years now. Um, so let me see if I can work a Mac. Sorry, I'm a PC guy. Space. All right, cool. So my first experience with virtual reality was the tri-immersion head-mounted display, where it says there it's discontinued. Uh, the owner uh, that created this had some issues with investors, but uh, the idea is sound. It was a uh, low resolution. It had head tracking. It had an attached gun controller that had all the batteries used to power the actual display. The display, it looked like you were looking at a tiny TV from far away, but you could hook it up to your Xbox, your PlayStation, and play any of those games, so Medal of Honor. Uh, now you could be inside the game actually shooting uh, at Germans. Uh, so these are just some of my uh, you know, lost thoughts that I put down on paper. I actually worked uh, patents for some of these, uh, and that right there, I call it the ankle breaker. Uh, it, was, it was an omnidirectional shoe made of omnidirectional wheels. So instead of thinking of an ice skate, think of just being barefoot on the ice. Uh, so it went every direction, and there was no control. 
Uh, but I had these constraining structures created that would hold you on a friction, a low friction platform, and those low friction platforms would uh, just keep you in one spot. So that was the biggest problem with VR, is now you're blindfolded, you wanna run around inside this environment, but as soon as you do, run into a wall or furniture or whatever. So how do you keep them from doing that? So this was my, my go-to, was I, I'll make a constraining structure and I'll keep them in one spot, right? So like I said, these are the, the failures. And this is what I came up with. It was just a, a hubless wheel with a constraining structure with these sandals that you could tie to your feet. And using these sandals, you could run around on this low friction platform in space and not go anywhere. So that was my solution. Uh, back in 2009, I developed it. Uh, the patent finally, uh, the application, I finally got it approved, uh, 2012. And uh, I was working on it, uh, developing how to make this work. Uh, the first one <laughs> was, uh, I, I put a piece of plastic on the bottom of the shoe, and I literally cut the sole out and put an Altoids can in the middle of it and put a wireless mouse inside of it. And whenever you push the wireless mouse back, it would push you forward in space. So every footstep was prope would propel you forward in the virtual reality, right? And then right would move you right and left would move you left. So it was just a, a quick, easy way for me to make this happen. This was the version that you saw on the diagram. It's uh, a bunch of furniture movers that I stuck to the bottom <laughs> of the sandal. And the sandal had kind of a boot strap, so multiple shoe sizes could fit inside of it. Uh, and, and use the same device. But it still had the wireless mouse, still the same concept, uh, and you could run around inside of there. So uh, I actually worked pretty hard on that. I tried to pitch it to a few people, and there's just, there was nobody biting. Uh, so really, it was my own personal project, and I used it with my Call of Duty uh, Medal of Honor, and I, I played with it plenty, but uh, nobody else. Again, it was my mad scientist adventure. Um, so what happened to all this development? Uh, that was 2009, here it is 2014, uh, and I've got something completely different now. Uh, what happened, and the reason why I got away from the kind of stand up, run around with the wireless mouse thing, was I dislocated my ankle. So that's me coming out of surgery, and suddenly running around in VR isn't quite as practical for me anymore. Uh, <laughs> marathons are out, gained a little weight, uh, stuck with Halo 4. And then the VR stigma is what really got me. Because me running around inside the virtual reality with a tri-immersion doesn't go well with a group of investors. They just looked at me funny. Yeah, this isn't gonna sell. So I kinda, I kinda gave up on it. And the dislocation ended up being a blessing in the skies because I actually reevaluated my train of thought. And I decided that this would be something you could do sitting down, is the constraining structure would be the chair, and the device would go on the foot. And there's got to be another way to measure foot motion without actually walking or running around. So this is what I came up with. That's me in my recovery boot uh, using the Oculus Rift. Uh, when the Rift came out, it kind of gave me a second wind. And I started using uh, my disability to an advantage. Uh, I started making it so that I could walk in a boot, in a chair, inside of virtual reality. Um, and how I did that was I created the stomps as it is currently. It is just an ankle brace uh, or an ankle strap that has accelerometers in it. And when you step, it measures the gesture of your foot going up and down, and that propels you forward with a W key. It emulates a keyboard, uh, HID. And then if you just stomp one foot, so your right foot, it'll move you to the right. If you just step your left foot, it'll move you to the left. And then I had it so that if you slide your foot backwards, it'll move you in reverse. So that was my solution. Uh, the idea, the key words here are, it needed to be comfortable, it needed to be inexpensive, low intensity, meaning you're not running around, you're not building up a sweat and fogging up your h &D. Wireless was huge, and then simple to use. Uh, I tried to make it as intuitive as possible, and then sim simple to integrate into a game. Since it plugs in as just a keyboard, Anybody who's developing a game can use it just like somebody who would be using a keyboard to move that game. Another thing is it's really difficult to use a keyboard when you're wearing a head-mounted display. 
it's hard to get your hands on the keys and uh, use that also kind of steals a little bit from the immersion so my hope was that this would give that back so issues with it it's not precise uh, because it's accelerometer data it's really ugly you have to actually uh, it has to read a pattern before you actually move so the first few steps are lost uh, the last few steps will carry you forward longer than you want. So say if you're in a virtual reality game and you want to walk up to a cliff, then you're going to walk right off the cliff. <laughs> okay? So that, that's an issue. Uh, it's too simple. It was just the WSD keys. So really all this replaced were those, those three fingers on a keyboard. And uh, it's not really an, enough like, to, to actually give you the full gameplay that you would want uh, with one of these foot controller devices. Uh, and then intermittent inputs, like I said, accelerometer data is just really ugly. Uh, it's got a lot of just raw inputs. Um, it's got gravitational forces. Uh, and then ankle position and clothing go with that because it's worn on a strap underneath your clothes or over your clothes. Uh, that tends to mess with the accelerometer data anyway. So I won't bore you with that anymore. So what I have today is my solution to most of these. Um, I've actually brought it into life, which I'm really excited about. Uh, this is the new stumps. So, my sneak preview all right, of what I've got coming. The new stumps will be foot mounted instead of the ankle. I have it a uh, custom PCB and enclosure to make it inexpensive. Uh, the unique strap or clip design, I'm pretty proud of this. Uh, it's got a replaceable clip that comes off and then you can put a strap in there and type, uh, tie it around your foot just like you see there. Wear it barefoot or wear it with socks, uh, or put your shoes on and actually clip it to your shoelaces. Um, so it could do any of those. SEC approved, uh, 2.4 gigahertz wireless, has to be wireless for sure. Precision mode and stomps mode. Precision mode is the new development, and I'll tell, talk a little bit more about that in here in a second. Uh, it'll come with a bootloader, so that any firmware updates that I'll have later on to make this more precise or better, uh, you can actually download and, and up uh, and implement as the user and it'll be rechargeable. So precision mode, uh, instead of having accelerometer data, this works more on a tilt uh, gyroscope. Uh, so leaning forward will move you forward, leaning back will move you backwards. And just think of that with your foot and you can do it right here, sitting in front of your computer. Instead of doing all the stomping, you can stop, go into precision mode, and then now lean your foot forward and then walk right up to the edge of the cliff and not over it. Okay, and then just stop and we'll put your foot level. All right, right, left, tilt your foot right, tilt your foot left. Kick and jump are two new actions that uh, can be implemented using that accelerometer data that is uh, not being used for your, uh, your actual stomps motion. So one single kick and one single jump will actually uh, plug in and kick can be any key that you want it to. So now you can pull the trigger and shoot your gun with your kick motion uh, and just kind of program it yourself. So a two foot combination, you can do anything that you want to, set it up how your game preferences are. So think of if you're, uh, work, or you're in a game and you're in Skyrim, you want to walk around, uh, you would set up your uh, right controller to do all of your walking movement. And then your left controller will be your special key. So if I wanted to sprint forward, I could use my right foot, tilt it forward. That would push the shift button. And now my right foot moving up would walk me or sprint me in whatever direction it is that that's tilted. So it basically uses combinations of movements to move you, propel you in that direction. All right, or it could be used to rotate with one foot and strafe with the other foot. So basically the idea here is that it gives you a lot more keys, a lot more inputs, uh, controllers, while still keeping it simple and easy to use. And the stomps mode will still be incorporated, so you'll still be able to run around in your games, but now you'll also be able to have that precision motion. So future plans, Kickstarter, I'm thinking May. That's just uh, a date that I came up with. We'll see, I I'd like some feedback, so if you guys have any thoughts on this or, uh, you know, any game stoppers, definitely let me know. Uh, I want to optimize the CPU to keep it low power, uh, save the battery life. Uh, because this is going to be a high intensity game, 
I definitely want you to, excuse me, low intensity device, I want you to be able to have a lot of endurance in game. So you should be able to use this for long game sprints rather than quick jaunts uh, using something else. Uh, key, key stick or key uh, joystick controls rather than keyboard inputs. Uh, have a user GUI so that you can easily reprogram all of the functions of this device and make it whatever it is that you want. And then Bluetooth low energy, uh, just in case the consumer version of the Rift happens to be a standalone device, which is kind of leaning towards, uh, or if there's another virtual reality device that's coming out that maybe uses a mobile phone and as the display, this should be able to hook right up to it and uh, give you that tilt sensor that would be used instead of the uh, actual tilt sensor in the phone. So we'll replace that. Cool. All right, well, thank you. Like I said, I'll, I guess I didn't make it very short, but uh, I appreciate uh, everybody listening and uh, Carl for giving me this opportunity. So if you all have any questions the, that you feel like everybody would like to hear, go ahead and shoot, or we can meet up after this uh, in the demo. What you got? So the last version <laughs> of the device that was here last time, you kind of had, had your feet on the ground in order to use it. Yep. To stop the motion. This one, I, I get a feeling like you might be better off if your feet are suspended in like a stool or a higher seat than being on the ground. Have you tried that and what do you think? Yeah, it's a good, it's a good point actually. Uh, one of my first implementations of this one, I actually had a little half dome ball that would go with the strap and you would rest your feet on that half dome ball uh, and that would give you that forward and backward, left and right motion. Uh, it would help, you, help your feet to, to get to that position uh, backwards or forwards. So yeah, kind of suspended, but yeah, I think that that's, that's true. You could do this with you know, your hand if you wanted to. True. Yeah, good. This might not be the intended purpose, but can you imagine for a fitness buff being able to like, strap this on a stationary bike or a treadmill? Kind of sure. Uh, the Stomps mode right now would do that. Uh, it's just the accelerometer data in a pattern, any pattern would walk you forward. So yeah, that would totally work. What's so, the ballpark estimate as to how much this might cost? <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Uh, I don't have an answer for that yet. Uh, uh, by May? <laughs> yeah, hopefully. Hopefully by May. Uh, just because you have to get a feel for mass production. Uh, right now I can tell you development's been expensive, uh, but the actual device, the components of the device are really cheap. So I'm hoping that I can get it down definitely under the $100 mark. That's for sure. What's up, Matt? Hey, uh, could you stream the data off the circuit into the computer, for example, and get access to the, the raw data as opposed to just converting it to key strokes? Uh, it is done on the USB uh, receiver, so you would have to modify that, but yes, yes, you, you could. Uh, part of the graphical user interface was that uh, you'd have a calibration, um, and, and the calibration would be giving you that raw data, so yeah. Awesome. Hi. Uh, could you just use a smartphone? Yeah, totally. You can use so a smartphone. You can make the strap for a smartphone. Sure, if you have, if you want to just use one, that's fine. Or you could have two. You could take your buddies and put it on the other foot, and you could have, you could have both of those. That would work. In fact, I mean, uh, the other devices, you know, Prio VR, uh, the high or the STEM. I mean, they, they basically do similar stuff. Uh, I think that what what this does is it's it's geared towards just that. You know, it's, it's just made for locomotion wirelessly uh, and then in implementing it as a, a HID, a keyboard. Yeah. Great. Any other questions? Oh, you good. Yeah, using the, uh, the precision you can get with the gyroscope tilts, can you make it more natural and intuitive such that people can just walk and based on the tilt of their foot while they're walking, they walk normally as opposed to having to learn a new language of rotate versus <laughs> sprint versus walk? Yeah, that's a good question. First of all is walking naturally is difficult because you would need a omni kind of device to keep you in, in position, right? The, the actual constraining structure. Uh, second problem is, is that gyroscope data when you actually start moving and walking gets a little messy. 
So uh, you're, you're going to be dealing mostly with accelerometer data at that point. But, what about like walking in place though? Yeah, walking in place, place might... I just tilt my feet in certain directions while I'm stomping up and down as opposed to um, having to remember that my right foot is for walking and my left foot is for sprinting and things like that. Right, okay, so the stomp, stomp mode is just the accelerometer when you're moving forward, okay. right? And then when you stop and then you start you trigger that precision mode, that's when you start the foot tilt. So I'll show you in my demo what I have set up over here, uh, how, what I'm talking about, but uh, the current setup is just forward, left, and right. So there's no, no tilting for any of that. But if, if you're asking me, you know, can you walk and tilt at the same time, you're gonna end up like me, brother, you're gonna have a dislocated ankle. <laughs> so. Right. <laughs> Did they answer your question? Yeah, okay. Anything else? Great. Well, thank you guys again. And, uh... Awesome. Thanks so much. That was, uh, that was great. That's a, that's a nice surprise, too. It was really cool last, at the last SVBR we saw, but this is, it looks like it's going to be even cooler. All right. So uh, next up, we have uh, Brian Bullard. Bullard? Am I saying that right? Bullardo. Bullardo. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Bullardo. Okay. That's just what I, my Reddit name, so. But Brian Bullard. Okay, okay. so we'll, uh, we'll give him a minute to get his mic on here. Um, in the meantime, um, last time I announced uh, our, our site, uh, vrjobs.svbr.com, uh, our new jobs board. And we're off to a good start. We've got some jobs on there from uh, Jaunt VR. We've got some Jaunt guys over here. And uh, Qualia 3D. I'm not sure we have, some, we have Eric from Qualia here. But uh, check it out if you're looking for work. There's definitely some jobs out there. And hopefully we'll see some more jobs on there soon. And uh, take it away. Um, hello, uh, my name is uh, Brian Bullard. Um, Bullardo on the <laughs> subreddit. Um, here, let's start this slideshow. Um, basically, uh, I'm a VR enthusiast. Uh, uh, most recently a game developer over the last couple of years I've been building a lot of prototypes and uh, part of the VR jam I made a game called the Intergalactic Clash that didn't work all that well but it was still a great experience and uh, been working on a game for about six months that wasn't going to be VR initially but the Oculus kind of changed all that um, it's uh, an RPG game that I'm working on so I've been trying to figure out a lot of different ways to do G uh, GUI so I've, I've messed with uh, UI texture and Unity and, and uh, NGUI, NGUI I started with for and did a lot of work with that. And then eventually I came on to a, another product called Daikon Forge uh, Library, which has uh, been really, has been really good for me. Um, just some best practices, things that I've, that I pulled from the web and also some stuff that I've kind of ran into is you don't want to have the users change their perspective of their head or where they're focusing on the UI elements um, or you know maybe have something scroll past them that they can't read you kind of need to put it right in front of them um, and I've had certain issues with that or, or if you have UI elements like a, a perfect example would be in a, a space game where maybe you have a targeting mechanism those those UI elements should render on where that element is in the Z depth, or else things can get blurry and can kind of you know distort things a little bit. Um, now, I can go through. Here's how I get back before Daikon Forge really changed some of the things in development. You had to do the way you would get it to work would be the same for NGUI and and Daikon Forge. So, so I'll go through this process here. I have a video of this process um, that's online and I'll give you guys the link if you're interested in um, doing this in NGUI also. So the, basically you create a render texture and you gotta point that uh, NGUI camera to UI target texture to render that texture out. Um, once you do that, you create a new material and then you map that material to a plane object and you take that plane object, you gotta parent it to the right camera, position it um, the Z depth that you want that UI element to be in. Um, and that's important. So 
if it's not parented to the right camera, it's not going to follow the character around. Um, also, if you want transparency, like transparent widgets, uh, the easiest way to do that is you can copy a transparent colored shader to another file, edit that text file, and then you can change, uh, change the color mask RGB or remove that setting from it. And then you can set, um, you know, or you got to find the NGUI Atlas at that point, choose that shader, and then you should have, uh, you should have transparency. So that, now that is the hard way. <laughs> like there's a lot of steps for that. It works. I mean, it works for both NGUI and Daikon Forge, but Daikon Forge has recently made a change um, that's allowed, allowed it to work a lot easier than that. So now Daikon Forge, some of the things I like about it, um, it's got data binding, event binding, it allows you to bind events from other components, um, unified input right out of the box, so keyboard, joystick, mouse, um, highly optimized. When I, started, when I started doing a lot of UI elements for my game, things were getting slow, like within GUI, and I just couldn't figure out why. I mean, they, you know, I was keeping everything in one, in one texture, but it just didn't seem performance-wise. Well, this one on sale, and I caught it, and I grabbed it, and I threw the same exact scene in it, and it was w way more highly optimized than in GUI. So that was, that was probably the biggest selling point for me, and I said, well, at that point, it was a rough decision to make because I'd done a lot of work already, but I'd said, well, I'm just going to forklift this whole thing and just do it all in Daikon Forge. So that, you know, that took about a month, but, but it was well worth it. Um, you get dynamic effects such as uh, um, motion tweening, tweening, really simple like motion effects, but it actually add a level of polish to the game that, that um, very easily without you having to go and render out motion tweens and then bring them back in. Um, it, it, it's really cool and um, also the API, uh, very powerful API. Just like NGUI, if you've ever worked with NGUI, they have a powerful API system, but this one, uh, I, I really like it a lot better. Um, so I have a video of that process on our website. Uh, it's podvr.blogspot.com. This is also a shameless plug for our podcast <laughs> that me and Matt do. Um, so. You check it out here. You can also just watch the video. Um, we're, we're planning on doing more episodes, um, and the information will be on there. And it's also on Stitcher and iTunes. And if it isn't readily available, I get a little nervous when I talk in front of people. I don't know why that is, but <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so um, essentially, I can show you how Daikon Forge works a little bit here. Um, create prefab. So basically, if you wanted to create a, an atlas, a texture atlas, it's, pretty, it's fairly easy here. Let me just go ahead and go through here. Scans. So basically we have a button here that has button controls and you can control the focus, hover, press, all within here. Um, you can also drive the controls through, through, the, um, through the API. So if buttons press, do this, do that. Um, you, you can add more different types of elements. Obviously you can do check boxes, you can do um, scroll bars, drop down lists, um, sliders, um, just add, you know, slice sprites in for for backdrops and uh, panels. One of the key elements to getting uh, it all to work with the Oculus though, is to try to keep everything into one panel because that way when, when your resolution changes, it's not changing with the resolution changes. So here we can go kinda in and show you how it works here. So generally what you would do is you would create um, some sort of ground and then bring in the Oculus prefab, uh, the player prefab. And then this is how easy it is with the new version. And 
all you would do is take your, your GUI and parent it to the right camera and then disable the um, camera control on the GUI itself. So you'd have a UI camera in here, you want to go ahead and disable that. And then once you've disabled that, you can basically walk around and game with the GUI. Well, you see it's kind of interacting with some of the areas, and you can control that with, uh, with sticking stuff in its own layer. I just didn't do that with this situation. So and I've also tied in the tabs into here. So the one problem that you will have is mouse control. Mouse isn't working right. You'd have to build a helper class to use the UI camera's position for the for, for mousing, but in my experience, I'm not really, the mouse really serves me no purpose inside of VR. I've been designing everything with the controller in mind, and this works perfect because it brings all your controller inputs in. Um, and then obviously, if you want to use the API, the API is real super easy to get working. Um, let me see if I've got that here. Bear with my slow computer here. So, for instance, that you know, just moving through the tabs, all you're doing is you're just grabbing an input, checking if it's true, and then you know, grabbing that that method and doing the method. I mean, and it's, it's that easy to do. Tie into the inputs in here. I mean, um, the API is really helpful. Uh, another thing is the developer himself has reached out to me in the last couple weeks because he said he was ordering an Oculus and he's actively developing for his product. So he has said that in his next few versions that he's going to have an Oculus scene available. So, and that he's willing to do whatever, you know, if people have good ideas or things that he thinks need to be done, that he will help to do that. Um, one of his main developers was out of town. I was gonna try to get a hold of one of these new scenes that he was preparing, but, but um, basically, it's that easy uh, with Daikon Forge now. It wasn't that easy a week ago before I just had that first long drawn out process, but now, you know, things are that much easier. <laughs> so other than that, I mean, that's really, it's a, you know, short and sweet, but I just think that this tool is really where it's at for doing GUI inside of Unity. And, uh, I, you know, if anyone has any questions or ever need some help with doing really anything. I've been spending a lot of time in this, probably the last six months, five to six months inside this program, and I've done a lot of really trick stuff, and it's, it's definitely cool. That's all I got. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, one, one other questions? thing. Actually, one other thing is, I'll set this up in the back if you guys want it with the Oculus and if you want to take a look at what the GUI actually looks like while you're walking around, we can do that. Um, I've got a couple scenes we can play with. So, and obviously any extra questions or if you, you know you want, I'm really here to answer questions. So, cool. Are there any questions? One. Um, well, it did cost, how much did you pay for that? I forgot. It was cheap, though. Well, well it was like really on sale. It's usually $75, yeah, it was but... $29 on one Yeah, he got it for 20 yeah, 29 I think. Unity, they cycle their sales, so that sale will come back if you probably wait another month or so. It but, was cheaper than Angui. Yeah, and if you know anything about Angui, and this is the thing, like, like um, Unity is developing their own, uh, you know, their own GUI system. But the guy that was helping them develop that has since left. So I don't know where that's at, because everyone keeps saying, just wait for this. I'm just going to wait to do my GUI until this comes out. But they've been waiting for years. So this is where it's at. I mean, he's, he's done a real good job on, on getting this stuff working. And I don't work for him, so. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, I have a question. Um, I, I think uh, Gavin asked earlier, um, is it, does it require DLLs? Yeah, or, well... Will it, will it work with the web player, I guess? Yeah, 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 yeah. or work with the web player. Um, it, yeah, I don't think it has DLLs at all. I think it's all... No, 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 it's all source. So, yeah. Sorry, I just I couldn't remember right off the top of my head. So it was... Yes? So I, 
I noticed the UI you were showing was kind of a 2D overlay. Do yeah. Have any 3D He's working on that. So that is going to happen. Um, and I'm sure, you know, in ordering the Oculus is part of that. This is something that he's been planning on working on. And I know NGUI has, has that option too, but yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to that. But right now, this is just what I've been working with. Cool. All right. Awesome. awesome. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, next we have Howard Rose, who's gonna show us uh, his uh, first-hand presentation. Um, oh, while he gets plugged in and set up, um, I believe, um, Matt, Sonic, where are you? Matt, there you are. Yeah, All right, Matt, you have a meetup coming up soon, don't you? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no. yeah sure do. GDC is gonna have a lot of cool VR stuff, and one of the cool VR things at GDC is uh, Matt and I are collaborating to have a SVVR, SFVR, VR, GDC VR Mixer. <laughs> Sorry, that's a little, that's a lot. Yeah, we're, that's the domain name, .com. <laughs> um, and we're gonna do that on the 20th, I think. We're, yep, so we're gonna send out the full details on that, but we're gonna do it, it's gonna be a few blocks from Moscone. Um, one of the evenings right after the sessions, um, we're going to go all night and we're going to we're going to take over a bar and um, we're going to have um, hopefully there'll be some Oculus people there and everyone else VR related who's at GDC and that's going to be a blast. Um, so hopefully we'll see you all there. That's that's going to be more of a social event, but we're going to have some demo stuff set up. I think for you know people are free to set up their demos and laptops and whatever at the tables, but it's going to be just more about just getting to know everyone and uh, hanging out with people that you wouldn't normally get to hang out with that don't live in the area that are here for GDC. So hopefully we'll see you all there. And um, was there something else? Oh yeah, and then, sorry, the, the last thing in March is the next SVBR, which is going to be the 27th. Um, and so far we have confirmed that High Fidelity, uh, Philip Rosedale's uh, company, they're gonna be here, they're gonna be doing an actual demo this time. He was here before and spoke about the project, but. Now they're, they have a lot more progress and they're ready to actually show us what they're doing and apparently they have some really cool low latency VR virtual world stuff going on, distributed virtual world. So really excited to see that. So that'll be on the 27th and I believe Cast AR is gonna be here. That's still um, to be final confirmed, but they said they're gonna be here. So that'll be an awesome one. So a lot going on in March. I hope you guys are all at all of those events. <laughs> okay, and then are you ready, Howard? I'm ready. All right, I'm ready. here we go. <laughs> Great. Hi, I'm Howard Rose. Thanks for having me, Carl, and it's a pleasure to be here. I want to talk about um, some of our work. Uh, my company is called First Hand. Uh, that's my esteemed partner, Ari Hollander. Uh, we've been doing VR for about 20 years. Um, my background is actually in education. I worked at the Human Interface Technology Lab, the HIP Lab at the University of Washington, and that's where I got suckered into all of this. So um, uh, I kind of drank the Kool-Aid. Um, I did my work in uh, teaching Japanese, using virtual environments to teach Japanese. That was my own research. So if any of you are interested in that, I can talk about it. Um, uh, so a long time ago, all of this technology came out of the military. And uh, the HIT Lab was really interested in how you, um, Tom Furness is big on saying, you know, beating swords into plowshares and how you take all this technology and do something good for humanity with it. So um, I was part of this project called the Virtual Reality Roving Vehicle Project, which had the unfortunate acronym of VRRV, which sounded like we were in a Winnebago. But um, we were taking the, what was then state-of-the-art machines out into schools and um, putting seven pound HMDs on children's heads. <laughs> <laughs> and the, for a long time, the experience of virtual reality was something like this. <laughs> and they would look at their feet. And they caught virtual sharks in nets while they looked at their feet. Um, thankfully, we've come a long way. Um, we've used a lot of systems. We've, we've bled at the bleeding edge. And we're excited about where this is going. Um, what I want to talk about today is just briefly talk about some of the work that we do in serious 
what is now called Serious Games, so I can tell my mother what I do. I do Serious Games, Mom. Um, and kind of what we, a little short summary of how we look at virtual environments and what they're good for. It, uh, a lot of you are, I know, excited about the Oculus, and I hear a lot of talk about games. Uh, we all know about the, the size of the game industry. Um, but there is the potential, I think, for the serious game world to actually eclipse entertainment games. When you think about all of the possible applications um, that we can do in education and health and all of that. So, um, uh, let's see, I'll just do this. So, I just want to talk about three things, three components of VR that we think are worth thinking about. Interaction, representation, and immersion presence. And how these, were, and how these come to play in some of the applications we've developed. Um, so, uh, these are all pretty, um, pretty obvious. Interaction, you know, the, we're all familiar with. This is an active medium, it's not passive. Representation is this idea that we can make anything um, you know, in a virtual environment, we can link any input with any sort of output, and we can make, uh, we get to create the whole environment from, from scratch. So we can make abstractions very visible. Um, and then immersion and presence is a, VR is a psychophysical effect, so um, that really comes into play in a lot of work that I want to talk about um, in pain control, and we've done a lot of work with uh, PTSD and therapy and things like that. So, uh, interaction, uh, we build a game called Attack of the S Mutants. A lot of the work that we do is funded by your governments, the National Institute of Health and things like that. Uh, the Attack of the S Mutants was a, a game to try to figure out how effective games can be at changing kids' uh, toothbrushing behavior. Can we get kids to actually um, change their attitudes, change their mind? Um, and I think one of the things about um, virtual environments that's worth saying is that it's a pre-attentive experience. So we, we just do it, and by doing it, and by engaging with sort of the, the game of it and the fun of it, we absorb the knowledge rather than this explicit teaching kind of thing. Um, the oral injection trainer, that's just an example. That's an AR thing that we did uh, for a professor in Utah. This was... Um, it's kind of a strange thing, and nobody likes to think about getting shots, I know. But um, so we had a virtual head, virtual mandible, um, head-mounted display with a camera on it, uh, and uh, so they could practice injections on this virtual thing while they're actually touching the mandible and figuring out where to make the injection. Um, so let's see. This is a this is a little one-minute cutscene from. Attack of the S Mutant, so you can get an idea of what we do as game developers. Let's see if this actually plays here. Bacteria. These S Mutants suck up sugar like a sponge and turn it into acid. Corrosive. Whoa. Sorry, didn't hear you come in. Hi, I'm Dentitia. Welcome to my workshop. Glad you made it. Did you see those Streptococcus Mutants? Crazy. If S Mutants do that in the lab, Think what's happening to my teeth. All that sugar, all that acid, these S mutants are going to take over. But I think I know how to stop them. I've been working on a transfractal resonator. I discovered a vibrational frequency that uses fractal symmetry to open a portal on the microscopic world wherever I point it. I've never pointed it at myself, but it's worth a shot. Stabilizer set. Vacuum bag ready. Umbrellator up, spoon emitter auto, we're good to go. Curve here will make sure we stay in constant contact. Here we go. Okay, and the adventure is off. That's Dentitia. Um, <laughs> she's fun. Um, uh, I won't go into great detail there, but so what we found was that lo and behold, we can. Uh, change kids' sense of self-efficacy, that they feel more empowered, and that they actually will brush their teeth more uh, as a result of this. And 
I will say, no dentists appeared in this whole thing and no dentists were harmed in the creation of the game. Um, and it's really, uh, it's really, the game is all about bacteria. It's about why you brush your teeth. So we're trying to give them, uh, use the virtual experience um, to help them transfer that, that uh, feeling that these monsters are, uh, are on their teeth and they're pooping out acid on their teeth, et cetera. I won't gross you out. So, um, representation. So we've been working um, in post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, done a couple things with the military, um, uh, a bus bomb scenario for a psychologist in Israel, uh, World Trade Center, things like that. Um, head mount displays, immersive systems, trying to give the, um, ooh, they're coming for us. Um, the, uh, trying to give the, the soldier, in this case, the soldier an experience, um, just enough stimulus to take them back to uh, Iraq or Afghanistan so that they will uh, recall and go through and, in a sense, desensitize themselves to their uh, traumatic experience. Uh, phobias, spiders, arachnophobia, um, you know, other kinds of things, fear of of whatever you're afraid of. Um, and immersion and presence. So uh, Snow World, maybe you've heard of Snow World. We've worked with uh, Hunter Hoffman and Dave Patterson, done a, a lot of iterations of this. This is probably the most, the longest running, most well-studied game for health out there. Um, it is a first-person snowballer. We're using it for uh, pain distraction in with burn patients. So this is Nathan. He pulled a pot of boiling water on top of, of uh, himself and got really burned. So he, these, these uh, patients have to change their bandages every day and it's extremely painful, stretching the skin. Um, high levels of morphine and opiates uh, and even that doesn't kill the pain. So we're looking for some sort of non-pharmacological alternative. So Snow World, um, has been used with pediatrics. It's also been used uh, in the military. And what I'd like to point out is that, so this, this all started, that's a pretty old picture, um, but this all started with head-mounted displays. And what we found was that uh, operationally and for a bunch of reasons, HMDs didn't really work very well. Um, and some of those reasons had to do with the weight and the ergonomics of it. Some of it had to do with the fact that they don't really work very well in a, in a clinical situation where you want to uh, move the patient and have them lying down and sitting up. Um, and uh, some of the other things are claustrophobia, is a, a, what's called allodynia, which is the not really liking things on your face or your skin. Uh, that sort of goes with a claustrophobic feeling and, and contact points and contagion and all sorts of things. So for a number of reasons, what the doctors started doing was taking these $35,000 helmets and tearing them apart and sticking them onto these arms and hanging it in front of the patient. And clinically, that was kind of working. So at the essence of this, we're trying to figure out a lot of the reason that we're doing pain research is one is to help people. But the other is, this gives us a really good, clear measure of immersion. And there's not really that many ways to study immersion. You can go and you can ask people, how immersed did you feel in the world? But that's self-report's not really very useful or very illuminating. So what we've done is we've changed. We've used Snow World, and then we've done a lot of studies looking at changing the field of view. What happens when you change this aspect of the world? What happens if you take away their ability to, to navigate? Um, they throw snowballs. What happens if you take that away? So we've done a lot of systematic tests looking at, um, you know, using Snow World as a platform and looking at how it affects immersion. And since immersion is the basis of all of this VR stuff to begin with, um, I think that's uh, hopefully useful for you. So uh, what we did was we said instead of taking that really expensive thing and pulling it apart, um, there must be a cheaper, better way. So our goal was to uh, create a cheap alternative to an HMD that could be used for, uh, for pain control. And we came up with what we call DeepStream 3D. So this is a common laptop that's a retina display, 2880 by 
1800, and we split it sideways. So uh, we're trying to get a very wide field of view because we, field of view we know uh, has, a, has a, an important effect on immersion. So um, this is, I'm actually gonna demo, I brought the device and I will set it up and I hope you'll come and take a look at it. Um, but basically, so it's a viewer, it slides down on top of the, of the laptop and then uh, we split it left and right, or uh, top and bottom with periscopic mirrors. So it's no electronics. We're trying to get a very, very low cost system here that can be used by doctors and hospitals. Um, and also, we're gonna do the same thing to an iPad or, or a tablet, and uh, we'll have a portable system too. Um, it's, so why is that cool? So one reason is that these large displays are much more robust. They're much better than micro displays, than phones, than all of these other things. Um, and it's a durable technology, so it's going to work in the, in the environment of, of a hospital or a home or something like that. Uh, wide field of view or 86 degree diagonal, it's high res, so 26, about 2600 by 900, we have an overlap, so that it's actually bigger than that. Um, our angular resolution is, three, is 30 pixels per degree. By comparison, uh, the current Oculus is about 7 pixels per degree. Um, their quote high definition one will be about 10 or 12 pixels per degree. So if you do the math, it actually is about eight times better. Um, aspect ratio is uh, about 32 to 10. It's a very wide aspect ratio as you'll see, uh, but it depends on what you put into it. And one of the cool things is you can put any HD 3D content in and you can play it just normally. And uh, I will also say one of the things about resolution is that you don't have to give up your really cool UI because you can't see it. So text is very readable um, and the whole experience can be very comfortable. There's nothing to wear. Um, we, we intentionally wanted to get rid of that and it mounts on a monitor arm. I will say that I did not bring an arm here because it was too much to carry, but I just have a desktop stand so you can imagine but the picture uh, shows that and actually when we do it in a clinic what we do is we invert it so that enables us to reposition it in any way um, uh, so a little bit about pain because this relates to immersion um, and because i think it's interesting and i have the microphone <laughs> so uh, this is based on what the theory of, of vr pain control is related to what's called gate theory Gate theory is basically that your mind only has a certain amount of cognitive power, and we want to take up as much of that power as we can with the virtual environment. So um, two things about pain. Pain is a cycle of ascending and descending signals. So if you step on something, you step on a tack, there's a signal that comes up, up your leg, through your spine, into your thalamus, it spreads out into your brain, and then it goes back and pain is moderated by, in the brain by attention. So what we found is that if you can shift somebody's attention that, uh, uh, or take that up with a virtual environment, we can actually stop the, that cycle of pain. And so they, they don't perceive that they are actually uh, in pain. Um, about 15 years of VR research, this has been pretty well uh, documented for, um, it started out, um, Ramachandran with phantom limb pain, a lot of that's pretty interesting. Uh, so VR reduced more pain than a video game. As I said, this is uh, Hunter Hoffman's group. Uh, we did this study looking at comparing video games, comparing DVDs, comparing 2D, comparing 3D, um, and trying to figure out what it is, again, that uh, causes that the uh, pain reduction. Um, fMRI scans reveal the VR changes pain-related brain activity. I can show that to you. The field of view study. Um, so what we did was this bottom one, the field of view study, uh, we did a, a comparison. What's the difference between a 35 degree field of view and a 60 degree field of view uh, in pain reduction? Uh, because we've been asking this question for a long time, since 2006, about how do we make this cheaper? And what, uh, what Hunter, uh, what, oops, no, we're, we're not going there. Um, what Hunter found was that uh, 60 degrees is significantly better. And so uh, just generally in this research, 60 degrees is kind of where 
immersion starts, someplace between 60 and 80, and then it, it goes up from there. Um, so uh, that's kind of the dividing line for, for us, or that has been, uh, using 60 degree field of view HMDs. So to give you an idea, this is a quick little video. Um, let's see. To unbuckle my seatbelt or open the door, I believe my guardian angel just took me out of the truck. First Lieutenant Samuel Brown survived an attack on his Humvee in southern Afghanistan. But he would then have to endure rounds of surgery, skin grafts, and painful skin stretching. This is a battle that's going to take years to, to get back to being how it was prior to this. But while Brown's body fights that battle, virtual reality technology lets his brain enjoy hurling snowballs to the music of Paul Simon. <laughs> University of Washington researchers Hunter Hoffman and David Patterson designed the virtual reality game Snow World to occupy burn patients' minds during painful wound cleaning or physical therapy. Snow World is the opposite of uh, fire, snowy and cold. It's supposed to cancel out and help distract them from remembering their original injury. Their previous research showed that not only do patients report less pain in Snow World, MRI scans show it reduces the brain's pain signals. Brown's doctors see real improvement. What we saw was marked improvement in the range of motion that we were able to achieve, and most importantly, an increased uh, level of comfort. As published in the Journal of Cyber Therapy and Rehabilitation, the soldiers even report a fun quotient. I spent some time growing up out in Colorado skiing during the winters and stuff, so, you know, if, if anything, it, you know, it sort of brings back some of those memories. A cool escape for a war hero putting the pieces back together. I'm Brad Closen. Um, yeah, so we're talking obviously really high levels of pain. We've all experienced some sort of burns, but uh, we're talking about people who 60, 70, 80 percent of their body burn. Um, he's pretty amazing. That guy has been on, he was in GQ magazine. Um, and MSNBC did a, a big thing on him, uh, which you can see at our website, which is firsthand.com. Um, so this is the brain picture. Um, so two important things out of this, uh, well, three. Number one, to have a, an fMRI uh, scan is golden in the field of medicine. Uh, so two things that they found, one is that when you use VR, you see less pain-related brain activity. So the parts of our brain that are normally associated with pain are less active. And the second part is that that activity moves to, and you can see it on the MRI, it moves to other parts of prefrontal and other parts of your brain that are more associated with, uh, with cognition. So this is actually a great finding because it shows us, it gives us a picture inside what's happening uh, in people's brains. Um, so what we did, uh, we just completed a study uh, that was looking, comparing our deep stream 3D to an HMD. And it was based on uh, this other study that was done looking at a 35 degree field of view and a 60 degree field of view. And as I said, the wider field of view proved it. So what we did was we recreated that study. And I won't go into great detail. But um, this, uh, as you can see from the picture, it was done actually in the, in the dental school at the University of Washington. Uh, we had 100 subjects, which is the second largest VR study ever done. Um, and it was used with uh, induced pain, so thermal pain, heat. And uh, we asked them, we looked at their, uh, their pain ratings and how unpleasant it was and a questionnaire. Uh, so what we found was that both the deep stream and the, hel and the helmet uh, had significant pain reductions. Um, and a significant pain reduction is above 30%. So I learned that a dose of morphine is actually dosed out to give you 25% pain reductions. So actually, this has been said that virtual reality is potentially more effective than morphine. So with no side effects. Um, so a quote, clinically significant amount of pain reduction is over 30% and more than 60% of our subjects got that. Uh, there was no significant difference between this and a 
helmet, which was, of course, that was our, what we were gunning for, and there were no gender differences. Uh, we also had very little, very little sickness, no dizziness, and that's one of the advantages of taking it off the helmet, is that uh, these people, a lot of people are in pain, they're in, I mean, if they're in pain and they have medication and doing, doing drugs and they're nauseous, we don't want to make them more so. So uh, it's really great that we did not have any of that. So our conclusion was DeepStream delivers an effective pain control without an HMD. So um, why do you care and what's the call to action? So number one is uh, we are trying to, we're kind of on a mission here. We're trying to make virtual reality uh, really useful, virtual reality pain control really useful and accessible to a lot of people. Um, I go and I talk about this a lot, and everybody comes up, people come up to me and they're like, my mother, my grandmother, my sister, my brother. Uh, I get contacts from all over the place, and we all know people who are dealing with chronic pain. So, um, you know, we want to move this forward, and you as application developers can help join us. If you have applications that you think would be good for pain control, uh, we would love to see them. Um, and we'd love to try to do this because we're trying to move this out into the world. Um, so another thing you can do, even if you're not into the whole pain thing, um, there's lots more stuff to do. Games, uh, simulations, virtual environments, and deep stream. There's no SDK. All you have to do in Unity is set up your two cameras and then feed that out into the over-under stereo. So it's very simple. There's no uh, processing overhead. It's, it should be pretty straightforward. Um, so use res because of the high resolution and the 3D, you can watch Blu-ray, as I said, but if you're producing video as well, this may be a, a useful way for you to see all of or a lot more of the pixels that you're shooting with your cameras. Um, tell your friends. We are planning to do a Kickstarter. We're also looking for funding, so uh, not sure what date this will happen, but please do tell your friends. And, um, my last point, which is probably the most important takeaway, is that uh, McCabe and Castrol found that if you put a picture of a brain in your PowerPoint, whatever you're talking about, that it is far more convincing. So <laughs> in, your next, in your next thing, see, I, I got you with my brain picture. So in the next thing, just find, a, find some place to put a picture of a brain, even if it's Homer's brain. <laughs> okay, and um, I am going to do a demo here. I'd love to talk to you about all of this stuff, and thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Questions, or what do yeah, you mean? Yeah, can you take some time? Watch. Sure. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that a key element of the injection was distraction. I wonder if you could comment on the, the degree of distraction in VR, Um, well, v VR is, um, you know, VR works because we feel like we're transported to someplace else, right? So if you put somebody in a helmet and they, you know, look under the table, under the virtual table, sometimes they'll go and they'll steady themselves. And that's part of that psychophysical kind of response. Um, the... Uh, I mean, I, if you're interested in papers, I've got a lot of them. And also, I would say that uh, in that vein, um, we have started a, an open research forum. It's on Mendeley. I don't know if you're familiar with Mendeley, but Mendeley is a great place to, to, uh, to share researchers, uh, to resources. Um, and I can give you a lot of papers about that. Um, essentially, about the phenomenon, what we found is that you can um, that, that VR is also a lot more, is potentially more sustainable in a way. I mean, uh, you can distract somebody with arm motions and waving and things like that, but it's just not sustainable. You can, uh, somebody did a study, uh, VR versus DVD versus nurses chatting with, with pediatric burn victims, patients, and um, found that the DVD was useless. The DVD didn't work very well at all. Nurses chatting and VR was pretty, pretty neck and neck. She didn't have a big enough sample to look at that, but VR was sort of edging up. So one of the things about VR is that, that the user can control it. There's a sense of agency with, with, a, 
with a with a video, you're just watching. It's completely passive, and this is that point I made, was that that interaction, that feeling that I can do something in this very helpless situation, I think is also empowering, and that, that helps people. Um, actually, we're really interested in chronic pain. We do work in the area of chronic pain. So the, the, almost all of the studies that have been done have been done with acute pain in short durations. Um, chronic, well, yeah, so chronic pain, we, we're actually working with a, a researcher in the, uh, uh, named Diane Gramala, who's up in Simon Fraser in Vancouver. Uh, we've been doing a couple of things. One is to, to use virtual reality as a way to um, enhance mindfulness. So uh, mindful meditation has been shown to be able to help people with um, sort of psychological issues and also uh, build relaxation and resilience for pain. And so there are about 150 million Americans who suffer from chronic pain, which is astounding. Uh, but, and, and all of those, everyone's a little different, but the idea is to try to, we've done things like use, uh, um, hook a virtual environment to a treadmill and do walking meditations, very slow meditations and trying to get people moving and also get people to relax and get in touch with their painful part. Um, or we're doing, uh, biosensors using heart rate and uh, galvanic skin response and other kinds of sensors to, so to in a sense, externalize the internal state so they can see how, how agitated they are and how much pain they feel and oh my, I'm losing it, my, I'm losing, my breath is getting short and they know that they need to stop and get in touch with that. So we're looking at, at chronic pain approaches but as you said, I think that the scenario of using something like DeepStream in the home is you know, I took my meds, I, I, they're wearing off and I have an hour until I can take them again. Um, so bridging that, waking up in the middle of the night, um, you know, they don't want to get out of bed and they don't want to bother their partner, they're just in pain. So, you know, if we can help them through those situations. And then what we're really interested in doing is basically crowd, crowd, so, crowdsourcing research. So one of the reasons that research is so expensive is we have to get people into the lab. And if we can send these out, that's one of the things we're looking at a Kickstarter for, is to get them out, to get them to people, and then we send them things and we, we build that dialogue. And we say, how are you using this? How does this help you? Um, but it's a, it's a huge problem, and we can do something about it. Yeah? Uh, this is really interesting to see all the applications in VR for treating. Actually, there's a whole bunch of people in the military included that are doing a lot of research on resilience. And um, if you're familiar with things like uh, Jane Gackenbach's work and, and Vivid Dreaming and, uh, or Lucid Dreaming, and um, people are looking at ways to, to build those experiences and then inoculate against uh, PTSD. So, um, you know, I do, I do know that you can um, traumatize somebody who has phobia by doing it incorrectly. That is, it's called flooding. If you flood people and give them too much, they'll shut down. And that tends not to be really good for them. Um, you know, I don't, uh, I, I will say that, you know, I see a lot of explosions on TV and in movies and things. And I built this environment for this, for Tamar Weiss, who's in Israel, it's a it's a bus bombing scenario, and so you're standing in this you're you're in this cafe and you look across the street. There's a there's a bus stop and a bus pulls up and the bus blows up, and the, 
you know, it's, I, I, I built the thing. I know it's a fake bus, <laughs> but is there something about this that, that I know that that's a real bus that people are on, that the person who's the patient who's going to look at this was in a bus like that. And so one of the things that we do is we modulate. We're able to control. Uh, the bus pulls up, there's no sound. Or there is a sound of a bus and they don't see one. It pulls up, it blows up, but there's no sound. Screams, and it gets more and more graphic. So that's kind of the work we're doing. I don't know that, you, you know, I, if we're not all traumatized by, you know, the games that are out there already, I think we're probably okay on that front. Yeah. I don't know that one. I know what's happened to us. We're still here. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I can proudly say we survived the dot-com boom and bust. Or, but um, uh, yeah, I mean, if you go and you look at the research, um, I don't think it's a panacea. But I think that the goal you know, is to reduce. The, the, the realistic goal is to really reduce the amount of drugs the United States uses 88%, it might be 80, I can't remember, 80 or 88%, it doesn't really matter, I'll say 80, 80% 80 of the opiates in the entire world. We are addicted to drugs, and, and those are pharmaceuticals, over-prescription, overuse, uh, and it makes you wonder what the rest of the world is doing. So this, this is a widely recognized problem, and the more that we can reduce our own consumption of it, and rely on other things, I think the better off we are. Is there a certain price point that's preventing adoption of this? What's the, what's the breakaway? What's going to happen? Basically. Excellent question. Um, you know, I think that, that it was a chicken and egg thing. The price has been, you know, we've been using $25,000 helmets, $30,000 helmets, and the, the price of helmets just never really came down. Um, you know, and now obviously there's the Oculus and, and, uh, and the Glyph and a bunch of other things out there. Um, I think that one of the things that our research has shown is that, and the sort of broadly applicable finding, is that you don't necessarily need an HMD to feel immersed. Um, you know, projections work. We do know that. We do know you can go to an IMAX and feel immersed. Um, so when you, when you get rid of, I, I'm, I was preface this by saying I'm, a, I, I'm very happy that the Oculus is out there. I think that H, we've worked in H, with HMDs for a very long time. They're very useful for some things. But in this world, in this realm, if you don't have to use an HMD, you can get high resolution, reduce our cost. If we can mass produce this, it will be half the cost of an Oculus. Um, and, and why not? You know, why, why do the, the HMD thing if you don't have to? Because for a lot of populations, um, you know, for pediatric populations, the, the, the Oculus lower, lower bounds of their IPD is, won't work for kids. It's made for adolescent gamers, so it, it won't work for children. So, so what, what effect does that mean? Uh, to me, immersion is also your ability to look at the bus and hear the sound. I mean, your system, that doesn't work. True. Um, okay, two things. One is that uh, we have found uh, in, in these, uh, okay, in those acute pain situations or watching a movie even, m people are not moving. They're sitting and they're, they're, they're stationary. They're getting worked on by a nurse. So we found that that was not, you know, it started out with trackers. We were using electromagnetic trackers and, and inertial trackers and things like that, and we found that it wasn't, wasn't beneficial. And we can get the effect without it. Um, the other thing is that I've spent a lot of time in my life with people with HMDs and watching people use HMDs. And typically, you put somebody in an HMD and they might look around a little, but they kind of stabilize and they, they stay in one place. 
and they might look here, and they might look there. If your task is really about changing a tire on a giant truck, and it, it means getting down here or fixing a fighter plane and I have to move around, those are, those are very specific things that need an HMD. But, but our experience of real life, I don't walk around like this. I, I look at what I'm looking at. And so we do change the field of view. We use a trackball and you can move around. So I guess my point is that if you, we should be using VR for what it's good for in the way that is most effective. And I think that the notion that you have to have an HMD for it to be VR doesn't really play out. Or maybe, maybe there's some nuances to it. Well, um, that's, there's a lot of great questions there. I think there's a lot of great research questions there that we could look at. Um, you know, I, I think, uh, so the PTSD work started uh, actually with a, a sort of a different approach with Vietnam vets. Um, this was, I was not part of this, but um, it predates me. But the earlier research was basically a constructive process so um, working with the, the vet, working with the soldier and saying, okay, what happened to you? Well, I was in a, I was in a swamp. Okay, we're gonna put you in a swamp. Okay, then what happened? Okay, helicopters came across. Okay, okay, we're gonna have some helicopters. And it was a sort of a generative process of building, it, you know, roll your own experience. Um, one of the problems with doing PTSD is you have to have in, in order to get the economy of scale, you have to have enough people who experience the same trauma. Um, and uh, for better or for worse, we have that with the military. If you think about all of the people who experienced the tsunami and never got any kind of therapy, that's pretty astonishing. Um, you're talking about a large swath of the earth. So. Um, those kind of opportunities really lend themselves to building an application. The World Trade Center, a whole bunch of people experienced that. Uh, we did some work in that, in that area. Um, but, you know, it, it, those are kind of the things you try to balance when you try to figure out what applications to build. Did you have something to say? Oh, yeah. Um, so when you bring this to Kickstarter, um, so your intention is to sell this to actual people who are suffering from pain, not medical professionals, or both? Well, um, that's something we quite honestly uh, grapple with ourselves. I think the first use, the, the first market that we go for is the, the most well-proven market, which is doctors and hospitals, and that tends to be how people find their therapies. Um, but we want, I mean, there are enough cool things that you can do with it besides this. You can watch your 3D movies, and you can watch other content, and you can play games, and you can do these other things. So uh, we think that there's enough of a reason why somebody else would want it. But primarily, the reason I think the thing that sets us apart from everybody else is, is really that we have we've thought about immersion in a very different way, and that that really fits into the pain world. So. There are enough people out there who are suffering from pain that if we can reach them, and as I said, sort of crowdsource research, that's kind of part of our goal. Or just get it to watch, you know, watch Gravity at home. It's really cool. <laughs> uh, if someone was interested in making an app for this pain relief, what would be a good place to start as far as research or to? Um, contact me. Um, we can, if you want to build, if. Probably most of you are building in Unity. If you do that, we can uh, give you all of the settings, the camera settings to, to build, you know, to make it work. Um, we're also using, we're working with uh, some of the player developers so that um, video content will play 
uh, kind of plug and play. Mm -hmm. um, so, but if you're looking at building games in Unity, we can help you, and it's very easy. It's mm -hmm. simple. There's no there's no extra processing or shaders or any of that stuff you have to do. So, kind of along that line, is there a particular subject or field that tends to be uh, the best pain reducer? Like, if I were to develop a game right now, is there one for chronic pain in general that, you know, is it just all interactive? Well, I, um, I think that, okay, as Hunter said in that video, that, you know, we started out with Snow World because that was kind of a, playing with this confusion of hot and cold. I can tell you that we, we also built another one that was hot, and it had, it was effective too. So. Um, I don't think that, that content is as much as what, what most games try to do is to get you excited and to build tension and to get you sucked in in that way. Um, this, this is a sort of a different experience. It's more, um, we don't want to get them hyped up. We don't want to, when you're figuring out, when I was playing with the snowman and figuring out how fast I want them to throw, it's like really fun to get them to throw like a, you know, like a major league pitcher, but we don't want them doing this in the middle of the, of the experience, right? So um, it's kind of being cognizant of what you're trying to do. And we have some, you know, we, we should actually uh, publish some guidelines about what would be good. Um, but. I would love to have that dialogue with you and anybody who wants to, wants to do that. Monsieur. Uh, so if you're looking at getting all of these applications built, what is your standardized control for the system? What do you think developers should be expecting the users to use to interact? What is your standardized control in terms of equipment or in terms of? Well, for example, the grip says game pads. Oh. Oh yeah. Um, okay. So for yeah, for a controller, we we just use the standard. I mean, I I don't really see any reason to limit it because those things are so cheap that if you wanted to plug, and this is one reason to use this device over an over, over a uh, tablet, is there especially an iPad? They're pretty um, impervious to <laughs> devices. Um, but I would I don't think that that's crucial. Uh, what I can say from building the applications and working with people is that you want to reduce the amount of load as much as you can. So it should be that old watchword, it should be intuitive, whatever that means. I mean, it should be low maintenance. I mean, I think something like what you're looking at in terms of a low, uh, a low barrier to entry, something that's easy to move, some motion. Um, you can use cameras, you could, you know, you could have a cell phone and take their, use, use the camera on that and use that as to track the hand. I mean, a, a lot of people who have chronic pain do not have great mobility. So um, it kind of depends who you're building for, too. But, uh, you know, a lot of this stuff is probably not going to be a winner. But a trackball, trackball seems to be good. Big button. One button, <laughs> one button game. Okay. What? Stops. Nice plug. Thanks. Uh, yeah. No, okay. Good I'll plug. pay you later. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate your attention. Right. Thank you, Howard. All right. So, Amir, um, I believe you wanted to speak to the group about the Make VR Kickstarter. It helped a lot because just like you and like us following the Kickstarter, you know, our card partners, you know, paid attention. Now, um, I can tell you that, that uh, I, I'm not going to tell you again that, that the same reason we didn't release a, a kind of a free version or 
a very, very inexpensive beta, although we lowered it to $95 as a, as a beta, um, it's, it's just that we didn't, um, it, it would, and we stopped it, and maybe we will if we get permission, if, if it's possible. But again, this whole product is based on a CAD engine. None of the functionality, all the bullions, everything is a CAD engine that has hundreds of many years invested in it that costs a lot of money. If we don't, there's no way we can give that for free. That's just not going to happen. But if we could have taken the, the piece of, around it and eliminate the bullions, eliminate the, you know, the modification of objects and give that as a, just a user interface and playing around with just solids and, and, um, and primitives, we could have probably, just we never developed that. So it would have delayed the whole process and definitely could not be done in the, in the, in the mix of a Kickstarter. We definitely now are looking for an early, earlier entry point for make VR. For example, all those uh, exotic, uh, um, you know, you can scale yourself down to an end and work in a, in a cockpit on, on screws, in a, in a, you know, uh, and then you look to your right and you'll see this giant avatar working on, on putting the, the jet engine. We, we have it now, as you saw it, I think, last, and we have five people now working together on a model. We spent, God knows, a year, you know, since the first one you saw it in April, we spent a year just because our focus testing showed that people want to, want to work together, collaborate. But then, you know, it costs us so much time and money, and when we brought it out, people said, well, we should get it for free. <laughs> And, and they didn't want to pay for that because we built it, as, as you will remember, as two separate, uh, you know, you buy the first module, make VR, and then if you want to collaborate, it's another module. And even that was very relatively inexpensive for the collaboration, which is just maintaining later all the servers and all that, or even if we work through the Steam farms and use Steam as our infrastructure, still, we, so, somebody's going to have to pay them. Steam is not a philanthropic organization, as we know. So. You know, we are now going every feature, everything about the plan is being looked at very carefully and understanding not only the, the audience that we are starting with, we're also understanding, you know, what feature set we're going to come with, how can we bring it at $95 or even how can we bring possibly a, a system that will start at, you know, $45 and then will allow people to upgrade. We're trying to figure that out, and we need to, you know, we need to figure out which are the, the, the initial critical features that need to be in that initial package, and how we're going to work it out, you know, with upgrades and all. It's, I hope I answered. It's a very long answer. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> We, what, what do you call, who, who do you call an artist? Um, Meaning, did you see the video we released on the Hackney, David Hackney <coughs> um, set, the, the stage set, the David Hackney, one of, what's the, what's the, the, the show, the theater uh, production? It's a, it's a David Hackney is one of, to those who don't know, is a very renowned artist. Straight, old-fashioned, crazy artist. And he allowed us to take one of his pieces and model it. And we took a kid out of Academy of Arts here in, in San Francisco that just graduated last, I think, less than a year ago. And we gave him as a 2D artist. Never touched 3D ever in his life. Never. He's a, he's a, he's a what, what do you call what he does? 
composite artist. <laughs> never seen Maya, not, not to mention never had access to it. And he just sat down and, you know, built it. And, and it took him some time because he had to learn through the system. But it, you, as I really recommend, look at that video and tell me what an artist can do. And he's not a trained artist. Now, my, what I'm trying to do is get it in the hands of David Hackney and his hundreds of minions that's running around him and let them use it. And we have it now. You know, if you know Shapeways, I don't know if you know Shapeways. Shapeways is for the artists. So we just came from the, uh, the 3D print uh, show in New York, which was basically a fashion show. And one of our, uh, it was over, you know, Valentine's Day, as you can tell. <laughs> and they invited us, and one of our uh, uh, demo guys, to create a necklace, which is, this is the crazy neck piece that he created. And a video is available, you know, on the site, of, on their site. But the bottom line is, it was a Valentine's. It's kind of telling about the state of a, of a man's heart in Valentine's Day. And, and, and that's basically, a, was the opener of a very big fashion show with every media uh, from the New York Times to major media and, 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 and tech media. Everybody was there. And it's all artists. The users of, the majority of users of Shapeways are artists. And the, if you look at, at the video we did, Shapeways not only endorsed it, Shapeways went crazy with this. The blogs, the community, they were nuts. But again, it was too expensive. And it was confusing because we released this video with how do you export it into Maya? Because we like that. How do you take a, this helicopter and you export it straight into Maya and you can mess around with it and take it straight into your you know, Unity game or whatever? That's what, we, uh, that's what we know. That's our world. I've been doing it for 25 years. 3D printing is a foreign thing for me. I just love it. You know, my, my kids love creating in it and cre creating their toys so, and customizing things. So, go back to the basics, uh, you know, we've... I, I, I guess my, my, my question about point is, I, I, I worked as an architectural artist for 12 years. Um, so, the, one of the main tools there is SketchUp. So, SketchUp, pretty much anybody can make something. But the difference between what I can make and what, say, somebody else can make in terms of getting the visual quality output, in terms of just general part. And, I, and I'd like to see, uh, from the Kickstarter, I would like to see more higher end things built with. You see, you see, you see, you are, are you a modeler? Uh, are you trained on what? SolidWorks? Uh, no, 3D Studio Max. 3D Studio Max, so you're a mesh yeah. modeler, yeah. which is a different world. Okay, so, you see, you're talking about we made a product for yeah. people that are not trained like you. Yeah. Because people that train like you that has hundreds or probably thousands of hours of training, not to mention access to 3D Max that costs a little money, is not really who we want to help with. We want to help people that really have ideas in their mind, don't have the money or the time or the budget to learn how to use those fancy programs. We took a professional CAD engine that is state of the art, it's a solid work, a solid works equivalent that my industrial designers that made the stem made me pay $4,500 a seat. And I have three of those, unfortunately. They, we took the same engine as SolidWorks, the same company, Spatial. Same company, we took this, it's basically a similar engine, same quality of, 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 uh, of, of models, and, and brought it to everyone. That's what we've done with the stem system. I took the military simulation, motion tracking, electromagnetic technology that I built military simulators back 27 years ago. And then I did, you know, sports simulation with it and all sorts of stuff. It cost $2 million when I did the Callaway simulator for, for Callaway Golf. And, and now it's available at under 500 bucks. That's, you know, with five trackers. It's, it's, you go today to Pohemis and you pay, you know, $30,000 for that. So, 
what, what, what you might be right with, that we should have exposed more of the precision tools. Because with a CAD engine, precision tools for us, rulers, and comes free. It's easy. The problem is to allow you to do things very, very intuitively. To, that, to allow those things to be in VR. Because the moment you're saying, okay, no, now I want to measure exactly in millimeters or inches this wall and that wall. And here you have, you have Daniel right there. He's an architect. He has some interesting, interesting input to us, came to visit us. We will, we will have Make VR Pro, hopefully coming in 2015, and that's going to cost more money, I promise you. <laughs> and we will make every precision tool available, which is the easiest thing for us. But that's not what the community that we thought, the community that has ideas and want to prototype things, conceptualize, meet online and throw ideas and show even the clients what they have in mind, even architects, create a, a concept, boom, 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 build the environment, build the area, you know, put the, the, the basic idea of the buildings and bring it up. Yeah. Uh, I love the system, the environment, I think it's all great and the price is really not bad, but I think you're right when you try to cross communities. Uh, Going, gearing towards the Rift community, you're dealing with gamers, be them serious gamers or fun gamers. They want to create content for their games. So when you made it towards 3D printing, I think that confused a lot of people on what this was capable of doing. If it had been a level builder, so that I could quickly create uh, an environment for a uh, PS, you know, PTSD patient, and then I could throw that into Maya and then render it in Unity, that would have been something I could see that's geared towards the community, Oculus Rift community. That I thought was geared mostly towards almost a 3D printer community, and therefore it's confusing when it was made in Oculus Rift. Yeah, so you're 100% right there. What we've done is even worse than what you described. I mean, you're close. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're close. You almost, you almost described how stupid we are. But no, what we've done is worse because make VR using a CAD engine. A CAD engine that is using solid models. Solid models are not well suited for game environment. They're not well suited. You can export a solid model into Maya and you can work with it. And, 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 you, and, you, and we will make it possible, with not a doubt. But is this the way that you best get value from, from a, a, a solid modeling application? It's not. And what we've made a mistake is that we didn't speak to our community that we, you know, consider ourselves one of the, you know, pillars of, of uh, I mean, we, we put so much investing, so much in the VR community and the gaming community. What we didn't do, we didn't explain you what we're trying to do. And what we were trying to do is give the community a tool that yes, you can also bring uh, models into game uh, and, 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 and application like 3D Max and, 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 and Maya, but at the same time, you can take models that you created. That's why we did a deal, for example, with GrabCAD. We, we made a deal with GrabCAD, we didn't announce it yet because the Kickstarter, we shut it down before announcement, but I'll tell you, we made a deal with GrabCAD that you can, from make VR, tied to GrabCAD, I don't know if you know what GrabCAD is. GrabCAD is a, is a site that modelers of all kinds, from all over the world, upload all the models, the models that they're most proud of. And it's available for free. There's hundreds of thousands of models. So we made it so you can be in make VR, you bring the virtual tablet that we created, and then you click on GrabCAD, it ties you straight to the website, you choose which model you want, you download it more straight into make VR, and now you're starting to modify it and mess around with it. But what we try to do, what we try to do is, is bring from games to allow game developers and game enthusiasts and you know all those that make hats for TF2, all those that make, make swords and, and, and shields and whatever for Dota 2. We wanted them to take all those models that they invested so much time and money on, bring them into make VR, make them and modify them, and then offer it to the world via Shapeways, make a store in Shapeways and sell it to all these kids and all these people that just download for 99 cents 
those models to print. You know, they have now plus minus 60, 70, some people say 95,000 MakerBots and all the other printers out there. You know, eventually, and maybe it's too early, eventually there's going to be an overlap. I believe that from my understanding of the gaming and the gamer, it's the only world, the only industry that IP is improved when it's modified. Every other industry, and I come from the entertainment industry, I can tell you my partner is the producer of Spider-Man. He sold Marvel to Disney. Every character is untouchable. You cannot touch Spider-Man. You make a, 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 any, any change to the Spider-Man, you have 50,000 lawyers on your case. You, you cannot make a deal in any way, but in, in, in the video game industry, it's all about putting your personal stamp on your character, making it mine. And that's why we felt that we can reach out to the gaming community and give them a very easy path to take all the hard work they've done, everything they're doing in digital form, and not only print it for themselves, but offer it via Shapeways. For the, you know, Shapeways by plus minus like a million people in their community. Those people can download it and they make money for those that develop content. You know, it's very hard to, you know, there's very few people that make money out of TF2. Those that make can make tens of thousands of dollars, but it's not easy to make models for a TF2 or Dora. I can tell you because a lot of my art department very active in doing it, whether I like it or not. <laughs> Thank All you right. very much, guys. Uh -huh. All right. Thanks for I think Amir will be here. If we have any more questions, um, oh, we yeah. can certainly give him more feedback, and uh, I'm sure they'll be back to talk more as they Definitely. figure out the next steps here. All right, so we're going to break out into our uh, demo session, our open demo format. So uh, thanks, everyone, and um, have fun. <laughs>
Uh, this is Prometheus. Oh, okay. It's a movie. Are you able to do it? Yeah, I mean, I think we can do it. Well, in a sense, that's a good topic. I think that I like to the like soft that I like to do it. I like to do it. I like you have a name for it? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> the other name is Cycles 2. <laughs> because the first one wasn't working well. <laughs> All right. Uh, you're on the wrong keys. What? You gotta go. Am I up one? Yeah, there we go. Um, if you have a pistol in your hand, you just need to go. Okay. You think so? I don't know. <laughs> That's pretty subtle. Very cool. Awesome. Very cool.